Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Owning It, where we're incredibly fortunate to be joined by Tim Whitehead, the Managing Director of eTupling. Tim, thanks for joining us. Okay, Tim, so we start all our interviews with uh, three questions. Okay. Who are you? What do you do? And more importantly, why do you do it? Okay, um, I'm Tim Whitehead. I'm Managing Director of a third generation family business. Uh, we're called eTupling, we're a manufacturer's distributor. And we sell a range of building plastics, hot and cold plumbing, underfloor heating and renewable heat systems into the builders and plumbers merchant network. Okay. And why do you do this? Because it's become a passion. It was initially um, an opportunity that was born of the family business in sort of 2009. Uh, my father, we know we're now third generation. He saw an opportunity for, at the time, it was purely an underfloor heating growth area within the market. I came in, got a grip of that and, and realised that the reason I do it now is I've got a real passion. What was originally a job has become more of a, an aspirational thing, a, a career and a, and a desire to be a bit of a leader in, in what we do. Desire is to achieve something really, that's why I do it. Okay. And so I'm intrigued about that, that moment that you say when it became just a, a, a job to then becoming a passion. Would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it was born of the fact that I had two young children. Uh, my son, Sam, was born in 2006. Uh, my daughter, 2008. I was married to Joe in 2004. I was working in recruitment. It was, it was okay. Right. I enjoyed it. It was construction recruitment. Um, I'm essentially selling people into businesses. But my father was at a point there where, you know, he'd inherited a family business because originally it was the, the, the toppling name in our business is the maternal name. He saw a niche in the market where to distribute a product into a builders and plumbers merchant network was working well, but there was this growth area of underfloor heating, right. which was a luxury product, but people wanted access to it. And he just kind of said to me, do you want a job? Not all fathers would do that, yeah, yeah. but he clearly wanted some support. He wanted some sort of exit strategy. What's ironic about that is he's not exited yet because he's enjoying himself, which is great. But that, at that point, it was a job. It was to suit my lifestyle with two young children. It gave me a little bit of balance. And probably by about 2014, 15, when my sister joined the business, she came from a, a more academic background. She was a chartered QS. I realized that what we had was a real opportunity. So what was a job then became a real passion because the opportunity in front of us was to be the best at what we could do in our sector. And, and not just offer an off the shelf product into a client base that demanded service and a good price, but yeah. to actually be a consultant and help those customers understand why they needed something, what worked and what didn't work. I'd like to come back and talk about some of the challenges within the business, first yeah. of all, but I'm interested in your own personal journey before that. I mean, yeah. was it very deliberate that you hadn't joined the family business before your father invited you in? It was my father had got involved with it in the early 2000s, in his mid 50s. Um, we'd never really discussed me being involved with the family business. Right. I was doing quite well within recruitment circles. There was a bit of a recession, we recall it, late sort of 2008. So recruiting into the construction market went from being reasonably lucrative to being no income really. So the timing was right. And that's when I chose to get involved with it, but it was never a, a deliberate move to be involved with the family business. So then going from that father-son relationship to then actually being colleagues and partners yep. can often, I imagine, be sort of loaded with difficulties or sort of potholes that, that many of us wouldn't necessarily be aware of. Yeah. How have you found that? Do you know what? I, I never, it never crossed my mind when I joined the business that would be an issue. I was very fortunate that I had a very strong relationship with my dad. Um, we played a lot of golf together. You know, we did lots when I was younger. Golf was our thing. We always played golf on a Saturday. Right. So when he asked me to join the, I, I never thought when he asked me to join the business that there'd be, be any clash, never bothered me. And to this day, we, we've not really had a crossword. You know, we've had differences. We've had differences of opinions. That's natural, but, uh, but at no point has it been, been a problem. So how do you resolve those differences when they do occur? I'm quite, quite a direct person, so I'm not, it doesn't bother me if I need to have a reasonably difficult conversation about something, but equally, you know, we, we, we've kept a line in the sand. The family thing's the family thing. This is a business, it's professional. It's not a father-son conversation. It's a conversation between two people who, who technically, regardless of their job titles, they're responsible to the business. So what does the business need? It, differences of opinions are fine. What works for the business? We, we've just gone about that by 
purely having a professional conversation about things. So the line in the sand, tell me how you make that distinction then, between uh, how you guard that distinction between family and business. I think the line in the sand's difficult because, you know, we're all very aspirational people in our family, but our aspirations are slightly different. So it, it, my desire might be to get the business to be the market leader in its sector. Someone else's aspiration might be to make sure they've got a comfortable lifestyle, they've paid all the bills, they've got an exit strategy and the future's covered. I think the way we've kept the line in the sand is at, at times it's just been a case of being happy to disagree with something at work, but let's not have the conversation about it on a Saturday afternoon when we're sat around a meal table with the kids. Right. We've just chosen not to do it. And don't get me wrong, that's not always easy. Sometimes that can be quite difficult. But most of the time we've kept a good balance with that. Brilliant. And what about when you added your sister into that dynamic as well? Well, at that point, it was a case of the business needed something. And also, I think it would be fair to say that it worked for my sister at the time. Sally's a chartered QS. She was very, very capable at coming in from a contractor background and looking at our spend, looking at the cost, looking at how the business operated financially. By no means did she have any aspirations to be a financial director, but we needed, we needed I needed support commercially but she also was able to come in, give that support and also look at how we were operating, operational costs and all the financial side of, you know, suppliers that we were spending money with, chasing money, cash flow and forecasting. And then we've just evolved further again over the last probably seven or eight years. We've really jumped from being what was a lifestyle business when my sister joined the business to being, you know, quite a, quite a big medium-sized, well, an aspirational medium-sized business that's, you know, we grew 58% last year. Wow. Which is a lot, but albeit from a smaller level. Yeah. Um, and now we're at a position where we've got to make some difficult, but advised choices on moving forward now. So tell, so tell me about that. Given that we sell into a market that, I, I won't go as far as saying it's been COVID proof, but the topical nature of the last 18 months of what we've all faced as a society has not been lost on me. And it's caused a lot of difficulty at work with people and change and, and the unfortunate timing is that the business has grown at a time when people were restricted in their movements, they couldn't come to work, we had to make certain plans. But the challenge ahead of us now is, now that we've evolved, now that we've moved through that and, and we continue to take that, that evolution on, the construction market that we sell into demands service, demands price, demands that we always have products on the shelf. But we want to make sure that we offer a level of consultancy. If you think about the wonderful pr um, principle that people like the business that Amazon is, you know, if you want something next day, you click a button, it's there, delivered, bang, done. That's what the world we live in demands now. So what we're trying to do is make sure we can offer that with all the products selling into our builders and plumbers merchant network. But also the, the trick now is to future proof it a little bit and make sure that the underfloor heating section of what we do evolves with, you know, sustainability, carbon net zero. Um, heat pumps. So what, what I'm personally, uh, I've got a real passion for is making sure that looking ahead, and even though we might not have been asked the question by a lot of our builders and plumbers merchants customers, yep. they are going to get asked by their customers about, well, I don't want a gas boiler. I need air source heat pump. You know, we need solar. We, we need ground source. How can we put this whole package together? So as a business, we need to make sure that we're prepared for that. We can provide that service. We can be competitive on it and we can do it maybe slightly better than our competition. So, I mean, that's a question that really intrigues me about your business then, Tim, is um, what would you say is the thing that distinguishes you from any other competitors in the market that's led to this 56% growth? What is it that you do better than anyone else in your industry? I think we combine the ability to distribute a product as well as most of our competitors we select and we cherry pick certain ranges from market leading manufacturers. That's where we compete well. Our differential, I think, is that we offer a bit of consultancy. We offer a bit of technical support. We can give a bit more guidance to our customers. We can anticipate what their requirement might be sometimes before they even know it themselves. So rather than being a distributor that puts a product on the shelf, makes sure it's the right price, then sells it out immediately, Yes, we can do that. Yeah, yeah. But we can also turn around to them and say, did you know you could also do this? Were you aware that we could offer you some technical support on this? And if not, working with one of our suppliers or our partners, we can offer you a bit more. So 
it's a bit more, a bit more hands on. It's a bit more personal. Yeah. I think, and I think that's born as of the family value that we have. Because even though we've grown, if you look at our core values, and a lot of companies have core values, and I dismissed them years ago in, in corporate business, but it's right. Our core value is that we're a family business. And, okay. and to me, that means we should give people a service and look after them. So what would you say those values are then? If I came into your business, what would I see people behaving like that would give me an idea of the values? I think that there's three or four that we've settled on as a business, but there's three really. Other than family, there's two others that stick out for me. And one of them's courage. You know, from a people point of view, being prepared to put your hand in the air. Tell me you're not happy with something. Tell me you think we should do something a different way. Yeah. The structure's not set in stone, it's open. You know, if, if we, you know, we've got a management team in place now and we've said to them, look, if there's something not right, tell us, we'll change it. Have the courage to put your hand up and tell us because we don't know all the right answers. But it's just that level of integrity as well. I think so courage and integrity. Courage and integrity. What, what's the perception that our customers have of us? What do they think? What do they know they're going to get? Now, integrity branches off into all sorts of different things. Yeah. But, but technically, it's been personal. Um, it's been consistent and it's been reliable. Don't, that, that, that's integrity for me. Okay. Where people always know where they stand with you. So give me an example of courage then within your business. In its most basic form, uh, making decisions maybe five, six years ago where we looked at the, the products offering we had into the market and saying, you know, maybe the time is to just venture into something new, throw something else into the mix. We don't know what's going to happen, but we think this is right. Yeah. And then just going for it. Not making a business decision, making making a business decision. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Making a business decision, but also being prepared to sort of go with a gut feeling. That that's a good example of courage. The rest of what we've done now is, I suppose, without really classifying it as that. One thing that I realise now, in, in March of 2021, when we've all been hit with lockdown, we're literally in the throes of moving from a 12,000 square foot premise to a 25,000 square foot premise. And then there's three or four sets of eyes sat around a table going, you do realise that we're going to double our overhead, we're going to triple this cost, we're going to, and, and yet we don't know what's going to happen in the next 10 months. Yeah. Well, I'm like, well, we're not going to let this get in the way of what we've built to do for the last 10 years, so let's just, let's just jump, let's do it and see what we get, really. So, I mean, if we can go into that decision-making process then, yep. just of, of deciding to go into that bigger site, did anyone on your management team do what you'd encourage them of putting their hand up and going, saying, I'm not sure this is the right move? That's happened more in the last eight to 12 months than it's ever happened. Right. I think as we've evolved as a business, we have, we've, had, we've not had a lot of people move away from the business, which is great, because that means we've been doing something right. But we've always had people who have been great at reacting to situations. What I've really wanted as a director of the business is, is to be proactive. And proactive means having that courage and putting your hand in the air and, and picking the phone up and speaking to a customer and, and, and grabbing something and, and really shaping it. I've got examples in the last eight months in particular where we've got middle management who said, don't agree with that, we should do it this way. And we've implemented new process. So tell me how, like, how you respond to that challenge then. I think I've evolved personally. I think I've just realised that maybe, maybe 10 years ago, I'd have been quite bullish. I want to control this. You know, my wife thinks I'm a bit of a control freak. I'm reasonably comfortable with that. <laughs> um, but, but I would have wanted to control that whole situation. We're right. doing that, we're not doing that. What I've done now is that we, we've brought people into the business who have got different experiences. They know better. They can see what we're doing. They know the path we're on. They've wanted to join that, but they've come up with great ideas. So we've just let them run with them. You know, we've, little things that have really been pivotal for us in the last few months about simple processes, automation, moving yeah, yeah. with technology, you know, changing our social media, you know, and, and, and how we present ourselves to the world. But we brought people in and we've just said, you guys have got the skills. We're not going to tell you how to do that. Just, just get on with it. Which makes perfect logical sense, but emotionally, that's quite a difficult skill to learn to relinquish control. I think it's quite emotionally difficult to relinquish control if you feel that you genuinely can control everything. And I think I'd got to a point in my career, you know, was fortunate <coughs> enough to, to bump into our commercial director. Um, Ross is um, equally passionate about his career and what he wants to achieve. Yeah, OK, emotionally it's difficult, but if you realise that you can't grow the business and get it to where it wants to be, if you have control of everything, what I'm keen to keep 
to reiterate, and I say this all the time, is I'm responsible to the business, not, not to myself. So if the business needs something else, regardless of your emotional baggage and how you see it, let those people put those skills into play and let them run with it. So give me an example then of where you've, where, where you've gone against your own self-interest in the interest of, of the business. We've got, we've got an underfloor heating manager now who's basically um, joined the business on the back of redundancy. Um, he's been with us 15 months now, got a great technical brain. And I've basically relinquished control of what I do on underfloor heating specification. Um, he's speaking to the customers, he's dealing with the contractors. Um, it was my whole personal thing. It was one of the things that I was known at within our distribution industry in our area, in the north in particular. But I, I can't move the business forward if I'm going to hold all of that and manage and direct it and I've just let go of it all. And it's difficult for me because every day people tell you to delegate, don't they? But we're not all natural delegators. No, no, we? it's, it's a skill that needs to be learned. And, and I've admitted to him, I said at first, I've delegated that task, but I know I'm stood behind you because I'm trying to check that you've done it in the way that I would do it. I'm going to stop doing that, just deal with it. So when you're recruiting people to come into the business then, as you undoubtedly have as you've grown, yeah. What, like, what are you looking for as, as, as in, in prospective employees? I think, I think it changes, you know, you never age when you recruit, but I think as you recruit younger, middle-aged, older people now, I think we've got a great mix. I think everyone brings something to the mix, but if there was one thing I'm looking for, is that I'm looking for passion in people. I'm looking for them to understand that, you know, as a family business that's got opportunity to grow quite a bit more now, there is a real opportunity for you. You know, we're an industrial business, we're a warehouse business, we're based on an industrial park. So at the end of the day, if you want to pop out to Starbucks for a coffee for an hour at lunchtime, I probably can't offer you that because we haven't got a Starbucks within shooting distance. But if you've got a real passion for your career, I've got so much opportunity to move up a ladder because the directors want to relinquish certain responsibilities to people that are capable because they've got passions to take the business into other, other areas. So will you give us an example of somebody that, that has realised that passion and, and justified a decision to bring them in? Yeah, well, I mean, very, very recent examples. You know, <clears throat> we, in fact, we've got two equally. You know, we've got a business development manager and we've got a general manager, um, both who've joined us and been promoted within 12 months. Chris, who's our general manager, you know, he'd been unfortunate to get redundancy. He'd been in a, arguably a much more senior role than we brought him in to do. But the first thing he said to us at the interview, which, which will always rest with me, was that I know your business. I've read into your business. I understand your business. I've worked within a merchant business that you used to sell into, and I've seen how you operate, and I want to be part of that. I think I've got something to offer you. And we basically said, well, this is where we're at now, but if we can achieve this within the next 12 months, we can bring that to you. And we've done that, and we've delivered that. And that's, I'm proud of that, because, you know, I want to be true to our word. Yeah. But equally, I want to help myself personally, if I'm being selfish, and make sure that I can get a balance in what I do, because I know I've got some guy there who I can lean on, you know. And we've got, you know, one of our teams won um, a BMF award this year, a Young Achiever Award, because of, you know, what she did, what she's done for the business. So there's a little bit of external recognition. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and don't get me wrong, I, I also am aware that when you bring people into the business, you've got to manage people to a level. I'm learning this more and more because not everyone wants what I want. Everyone's ambitions are different. But we've got two or three examples who, you know, of people that have been with the business very, very short term, offered a lot, and we've rewarded them. And hopefully they see it the same way. Brilliant. So there's that really intriguing comment there of learning that not everybody wants what you want. How have you, like, how have you learned that? I think I've learnt it and I've been told, you know, we, we've had a couple of conversations as, as we've grown with sort of non-executive directors and I've, right. I've kind of asked people that I've worked with in the past, one particular guy who's working with us now, I said, have a look, have, have a little bit of look into what we do. What, what do we do well? What don't we do very well? And he's basically said, Tim, you're very, you know, you're very ambitious, you know, you're driven, you're very intense, all, all these things that I think are positives. And he's basically said, but not everybody necessarily wants what you want. So you're not necessarily going to get that level of performance yeah. out of this person because that doesn't tick their box. And it's OK that, because we need that mix of people within the organisation. Yeah, yeah. So it's like rain it in a bit and, and leave them be. And, and, and again, you're just opening up so many different fascinating questions, but that's quite a brave move 
when we talk about your value of courage to invite somebody to come in and assess your business yeah. and and uh, and then make an assessment of you. Yeah. So who gives you feedback and what's the most valuable feedback you've had? Some of the staff, particularly now as we've evolved and changed and, and we've got more <clears throat> proactive as a business in the last couple of years, the staff are comfortable enough to give me feedback, which is great. So what's the most valuable piece of feedback they've given you? Let go. Let go of that. You do that really, really well, but you could do that really well. That needs your attention. So feedback is let go of that and do that for the business. Okay. We can see that. So delegate that off and let go of it because someone can do it equally well if you give them the right guidance. Right. So who else gives you the feedback? Then? Who else gives me feedback personally? My wife. She gives me feedback. So again, give me the most valuable piece of advice that she's offered you. Really good question. I think she's just, you know what, maybe not feedback, but maybe just reassurance. Maybe she's just said to me, and I have a type of feedback in a way, yeah. because she's basically said to me, it's okay. Not everything's gonna work. The business has grown exponentially in the next two or three years, and it will be what it will be. As long as you're ticking most of the right boxes and you're doing things, and she knows what integrity and courage and ambition means to me. If you're doing things with integrity, then the people that want to be on that ride with you will, will stay on that ride with you. Good so, on. yeah. Who else? I suppose I give myself feedback and try and evaluate what I do. Um, the directors, you know, Ross and Sally, they give me feedback. My children give me feedback as well, to be quite honest. Go on, what, what kind of advice are they, or feedback are they offering? Give us more money. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think there's a degree of self-interest in that. <laughs> there's a degree of self-interest, but no, the feedback they give is, you know, don't get me wrong, every now and again they'll say something nice, like, Dad, this is great, we appreciate what you do for us. Can we do this? Can we do that? You know, my son's got a volleyball tournament. He, he plays a, a good level for his school. He's got a, a volleyball tournament, and only last night he said, Dad, we've got to be in Chelmsford in two weeks. I said, well, that's a bit of a drive. What time have we got to be? There he goes, 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Like, there you go. <laughs> Right, okay, but he goes, you work really hard in the week, so you don't need to. I said, Sam, you know, we, we'll do that, that's no problem. That, that's what we do Never. as parents. So it, it, I suppose it's difficult to assess perfectly what they give us feedback, but every now and again they tell me that, that I'm doing okay as a parent, so that'll do for me. Oh, lovely. See, I think one of like your, your strengths, like talking to you, Tim, is your ability to project forward and, and to, you've mentioned it with almost anticipating a customer's questions before they even know it's gonna come on their radar, or even as you're talking about your children, yep. being able to project as to this is what you need to do yep. to set yourself up for the future. Yep. Would you tell me about that? Because I think that's a really intriguing skill. I, 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 think, I think you just learn, you know, you know, I'm in my mid forties now. I've got no desire to, to burn, myself, burn myself out by working that hard that it just wasn't really worth it. But what, what I'm seeing now is that the passion's as bright as it ever was. I can see what's opening up in front of us. And it always used to worry me that in my twenties because you'd think about your career and you'd think, well, what am I gonna do when we've got to that point? And when you talk about trying to anticipate what, what's going on, clearly as a parent, we all try to anticipate because we work from experience and we know what our children, or we think we know what our children should be doing. From a business point of view, it's actually reasonably straightforward to anticipate what we should be doing as a business because, you know, we're all, all these buzzwords now about, if you look at it from a social point of view, the mental health thing, are we looking after our staff? Have we given the right, you know, are we putting them under too much pressure? Have they all got what they want? Let's anticipate what they are going to need over a period of time. So we've put like employee assistance programs in place and we've done things and we're evolving that all the time. We can always get better at that. But from a commercial point of view, within the construction market, from a distribution point of view, our, our customers, most of them, if not all of them, are well aware of the whole sustainability, the green thing, the carbon net zero, the move away from gas, the fossil fuel issue. So as a distributor, because we offer underfloor heating systems, our natural evolution is to make sure that the actual heat source that feeds that yep. is green, is sustainable. So we wanna make it simple. We, we, we're doing a couple of things at the moment that no one else is doing. And we're trying to introduce this simplicity because a builder or a plumber's merchant that's got a busy counter and a demand from the trade for products every minute of every day 
hasn't always got the time to consult on every single product they can sell. So we're just saying to our builders and plumbers merchants, let us take that pressure off you. We'll deal with that. We can anticipate what you're going to need, even if you haven't quite seen it yet. So we engage in the conversation with them and we say, clearly you're gonna to need, to need this option. And they say, yeah, well, you're right, we, we do, but we're not sure how to access it. How do we bottle it? How do we get that? This is how we do it. That, that's what we're trying to anticipate and work out you know, how we can work better on their behalf. Which reminds me of that famous Henry Ford quote of, if I'd have asked my customers what they wanted, then they said a faster horse. Yep. I think that you're describing that in very sort of pragmatic terms that you're anticipating it, but the ability to get them to see it before and to recognise it is still a skill. So I'm intrigued as to how much time you spend with your customers articulating this. Well, it's very much in its infancy right now. Right. You know, we, we've had a very, very definitive business plan that we followed for three years. And I remember speaking to Ross and Sally at the end of last year and thinking, how are we going to evolve this business plan? And, and the evolution of it was actually quite simple because what we've done's worked. So there's a lot of more of the same. But the additional part to it now is being able to take the time because I'm trying to devolve issues and work and projects onto other people that I've always had a grip of. For me, um, for Clara, our marketing manager, for Ross, our commercial director, and, and, and for Sally as well, what we've now got to do is get that message, engage with our customers. So we, we just try and make sure that we use social media platforms and LinkedIn, and we advertise it. So when people are maybe not in the cut and thrust of the normal day, we all pick our phone up at night, don't we? Yeah. And they can tap on and they can look at our LinkedIn feed and they can look at what we're doing. So we're just very, very slowly trying to feed the market with the information that we can do this for you. We're not going to ram it in your face, but if you need us to put it on the shelf and put it on the back of a vehicle and deliver it to you, we can do that. If your customer needs a bit of consultancy or you need us to put, you know, you need to be put in touch with a supplier who can give them the information. We're just trying to find out which client wants what. And it might not be the same as the next person, but it's just communication. It's just that one word that every business talks about. It's that communication with your customer. Did you know we can do this for you? It's a fascinating journey that you've been on then. So yeah. when you look back over the 13 years that you've been in the business since you left recruitment and came in, yes. what would you say has been the single biggest lesson that you've learned in that time? I didn't want to sit here and think of an answer. So the, the one thing that jumped straight, straight to the, the front of my mind is it's people and that empathy. Try and, what I've learned is, is look at what I've got in front of me. Try and work out, get under the skin of what people really want to achieve. Why have they joined the business? Why are they doing that? And without sort of saying to yourself, where do you think they want to be in a few years? It's very difficult to ask someone, where do you see yourself in five years? I think that, that question gets more and more difficult as, as we move on into, the, into, into this century because there's that much change but I think the one thing that I've learned in 13 years is just to have that empathy, to try and understand people a little bit better, find out what makes them tick. And then, you know, if you use the word manipulate, it suggests negative. But what I'm, what I'm suggesting by using the word manipulate is manipulate what the business needs so it suits them better. Because then, you know, everyone's pulling in the right direction. It's a happier crowd to work with then, isn't it? So if we were to ask you then, of what's, the, what's your single biggest ambition that you have for... I'm hesitating to use where do you see yourself in five years' time, but yeah. what is your single biggest ambition that you see as you project forward? I think I have a personal ambition, which is quite a short-term ambition, to get that equilibrium and that balance as my children get older, to, to, to make sure that I'm there for them. Because at times, you know, over the last few years, in particular the last two, three year, years, well, we've expanded alongside COVID, all the change that's gone with it, that timing has kind of worked, but has also been very difficult. 60, 70 hour weeks and, you know, and, you know, Sunday mornings in a warehouse and mobile phones ringing till eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night. That's not balance. Yeah. So my personal ambition over the next two or three years is to get my staff and workforce tight, doing what we want for them as people. Yeah. But so I can get that balance back in my life. But in terms of the business, I just want us to make a little bit of, um, not so much noise, but just put a little bit of a stamp of authority on the market and say, we're not necessarily going to self-proclaim that we're the best at what we do, but we're not going to let you down. Uh, and we're a great go-to distribution business if there's something that you need. Brilliant. Which is a, 
a great ambition, you yeah. know. And I think it's realistic. I'm not overstating what I think those ambitions. I'm I'm not as um, bullish to sit here and say we'll be the best at what we do, whatever, because if you're going to sit here and say you're the best at what you do, I think you've really got to know the absolute ins and outs of every one of your competitors. And we don't all know our competitors perfectly. So just, just be good at what we do. Be resilient and be consistent with it, really. Love that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. Thank you. Consistency is good. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate your honesty and your candidness on this one, so. Great. So what we'd like to do when we start to wrap up on this is ask a series of just quick fire questions okay. that that be interested in. So we touched on this a little bit in the interview, but what are the three non-negotiables that you and everybody within your business has to buy into? Accountability. That's a non-negotiable. Embracing diversity. We're all different people. We've all got different passions. We're all made differently. So that doesn't matter. We're all pulling in the same direction. You must have some passion for what you do and care. What advice would you give to a teenage Tim just starting out on your journey? I'd like to think I've just given that advice to a teenage Tim in the form of my son, actually, very recently. He's got his GCSEs this year. Syllabuses have been affected. All the kids have faced this with the COVID situation. And my advice to a teenage Tim would be the same as it would have been to him. What you face through a GCSE period in the next year or two are not going to define you, but see them as a little bit of a stepping stone. And, and if you don't climb up a couple of stepping stones, then it'll be more difficult to get an opportunity to get to the top of those stairs a little bit further down the line. So try not to argue with it. Try not to dismiss it. You know, not everyone's against you. Just see it as an opportunity to maybe make a little bit of a mark to get to the next level to where you need to be. What would you say has been the biggest sacrifice you've made? Family time. And would you make it again? Yes, I would make it again because However much that sacrifice is a little bit painful to think about hours I've put into work, it also means that I'm giving them a little bit of security for their future, which is my role as a parent as well. If you could go back to one moment in time, what would it be and why? You know what, I'd, I'd probably go back to, uh, this is a little bit of a curveball for you, I'd go back to the 1999 treble season as a <laughs> Manchester United fan and relive that moment with my wife at the new camp behind the goal. Yeah. When Solskjaer put the ball in the roof of the net and we nearly ripped each other's head off, we were that excited. I, if I could relive that, and, and, and you know, that's one, that one's for my wife, she'll understand that, that'd be great, I could do that. Pure adrenaline. Just adrenaline, love yeah. a bit of adrenaline, yeah. <laughs> How important is legacy to you? If I look at it purely from a family business point of view, I'd like to leave a little bit of a stamp about what we do, but in terms of what I leave behind and, and, and what's left for, family it's not as important i just want them to have security i want them to have a pathway and if and if it needs to be any more and they end up getting involved with the family business in time then so be it but there's lots of opportunities out there so I, i'd much rather they took on their own opportunities and their own pathway and finally what's one piece of advice you'd give for listeners of the old and it podcast be consistent with your beliefs and, and if you believe it's right, no one should be telling you anything different and, and just go for it, really. Well, thank you for your time, Tim. It's been thank a real you. privilege. Appreciate really it. Appreciate thank you very it. much. Thank you.